police. Yana has been a good friend of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. And we're wrapped that without any hesitation, she, she agreed to come today to talk about, well, not just the future of cannabis in Victoria, but the whole process around the parliamentary inquiry that was just recently concluded and the recommendations that were put forward to the state parliament for uh, uh, scrutiny, hopefully approval. And uh, so today is really about this, that process and Fiona's reflections on that. So I'm going to, without any further ado, welcome um, Fiona to the microphone, but also say we're all about respect here and listening to one another. We can have absolute arguments and disagreements, but it's got to be done with respect. So I'll just remind that's the only uh, writing notes that I have for all our folk here today. So welcome, Fiona, and over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Thanks very much, Peter, and um, those are... Um, kind of an embarrassing introduction to, to listen to. Um, so I'm just going to change my view because otherwise I'm just looking at myself and it's actually really disturbing um, to have a big picture of myself and I'll keep playing with my hair if I do. Um, also, thank you, Peter, to a really lovely um, acknowledgement of country and and I'd just like to join that. I'm I also am on Wurundjeri land of that Kulin Nation, and um, and I really would like to to pay my respects to to any Aboriginal people, or Torres Strait Islander people, or Indigenous people who are here today. And I think you know, as the chair of the Legal and Social Issues Committee, we also we're dealing with legal and social issues um, time and time again, and almost every time when we are looking at an issue, those impacts are always. Um, greater to our amongst our towards our Aboriginal brothers and sisters and again you know even looking at drug law reform and cannabis again that's the same thing when we looked at the statistics around arrests and convictions no one in this room will be surprised that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people were uh, vastly overrepresented um, in those statistics. So this um I, I, I thank you again for the invitation because this is actually the first time I've really got to talk about the report. Um, I'm sure that many of you saw some of the um, some of the reports uh, and reporting around the uh, tabling of the cannabis report, and it seemed to focus more on um, the report being leaked and more on the attempts by the government members on that committee to water down the recommendations. Uh, we sort of the actual report and the work that we did for this report it sort of got lost. So I'd like to touch on that. As you know, um, we had a broad terms of reference. Reference. Uh, this was really to look at the use of cannabis. And um, Peter asked me what was the rationale for this inquiry, and it is something that I have. Um, oh, thanks for putting that up, Nick. Um, it's something obviously that I have been passionate about. Cannabis law reform is um, is is an issue that's very close to my heart. It's an issue that I, I think we need we must change. And this report and the the objectives of this report was to create a foundational report, a foundational report that we could build on, that governments could build on, that we as a community could work from, so that we would have you know, a document that showed us, I hoped, uh, a pathway to reform, a pathway a pathway to a, a, um, a, a, a health approach to cannabis use, but also a, a change in the, reg in the way that we regulate cannabis use. Uh, and, and I think for the most part, it achieved those objectives. It is, I am very proud of this report. I think it's a very good report. Um, yeah, I would have loved it to have started with, and we recommend that cannabis should be legalised, regulated, and um, an industry uh, carefully established in Victoria. Okay, I didn't quite bring the committee that far along with me on this journey, but we've certainly made some real headway towards a new approach to, to cannabis. Uh, effectively, the terms in reference were really um, not dissimilar to where Canada's the terms of reference for Canada's um, final inquiry that led them to legalising cannabis. And that was 
how do we keep cannabis out of the hands of criminals and children? And when you pose that question, obviously what we're doing now is not the answer. Obviously, um, the criminals control the cannabis industry and, um, and young people are probably most impacted not only by the laws but also by um, the indiscriminate nature of that sale and the types of products that, that are available on the market. Uh, this was not about whether cannabis should be available. It's available. I'm sure that not a single person on this call would have any trouble um, availing themselves of cannabis today if they wanted to, even in a lockdown. It was about, so it wasn't about whether cannabis should be available, it was about how it should be available. And I think that's that was really uh, important to this. And it was it was really important to the people who wrote to us. And this, I think, I think we've set a record with the cannabis report that we received over 1,300 personal submissions. So it shows just how important this issue is uh, to, to the community. And a, a large number of them were from young people, but they covered from every age group. And there's actually a little dashboard on the committee's website You'll find it at the bottom of the report page. And you can go to that dashboard and you can actually look at where those submissions came from. What we asked people in that, pro in that submission process, yeah, that's it up on the screen, uh, in that submission process to, to rank the, the issues that were most important to them. Um, and, and we got some really interesting data from that. But what we did say, see is the community wants to see cannabis legalised. They want to see the end of the criminalisation of people who, who use or possess cannabis. And when we, are, when we looked at that question around um, should the possession use of cannabis be legal, there was 1,202 people who said it should be and 26 who said it shouldn't. So, and okay, this was a self-selecting um, group, but I think that does give us an idea of where the communities where the community sits on this. And in fact, probably the one that surprised me was out of that um, uh, when we asked about uh, legalizing the sale of cannabis, uh, we got one thousand one hundred and ninety people supported the legalization of the sale of cannabis. So this is about establishing an industry, you know, an industry, and only forty one people were opposed to that. So this was um, some really, I think, some really solid data and something for the, that the government can rely on. We also saw, and we it's probably the first report that um, that used wastewater data uh, within its report. I don't think we've seen many uh, parliamentary reports um, uh, use wastewater as part of their research, but we did for this one. And what we saw there was that Cannabis um, is more wide, is more prevalent. The use of it is more prevalent in regional Victoria than Metro Victoria. And that, so that actually really um, uh, emboldened us to, to reach out to those regional areas. So we, did, we didn't do badly. We, we always want to hear more from regional areas, but we didn't do badly. And I think we received close to a sort of 300 submissions from individuals in regional areas. And so that was really important to us. We certainly, we used our Facebook advertising and things to really reach out to regional communities to get that information. Um, we heard, so as I say, we, we got a tremendous number of personal submissions, but we also got some really obviously quality submissions from uh, organisations. And I thank, and I suspect some of those organisations might be here with us today. And I thank those organisations for the work that they put into, into this. Um, again, overwhelmingly, all of the organisational reports that we received uh, called on uh, law reform, called on changes. And, and, and where they sat in that spectrum um, varied. And we, you know, we had, for example, so the, the, health, um, the health workers, uh, the HACSU, the Health Workers Union, uh, they... They recommended that we legalise cannabis, 
that the government own the cannabis, that they sell the cannabis, and that they use that money to invest into mental health services um, and pay for new mental health and drug treatment in Victoria. And it was bold, it was a really bold, um, it was a really bold submission from them. But you know, I frankly, it makes a lot of sense for the government to, to profit from this because we know nationally we spend, I think it's something about eight billion dollars on criminalizing cannabis um, and other drugs. And um, and that's probably around the number at uh, the profit, the profit that criminal organisations make from the sale of cannabis every year. I think there's a fairly balanced. The Victorian police um, made an estimate some time ago and they estimated it, the market to be worth around $9 to $10 billion. So this is a big, lucrative market. And the police in their submissions um, talked about how lucrative that market was, talked about how dangerous that market was, talked about the billions of dollars that was made in that market, talked about how difficult difficult it was to control that market, talked about how that money that was raised then was used to fund um, the production uh, of other substances like methamphetamine, but also was used um, to to purchase guns, uh, to to run criminal organisations. And yet, after saying all of that, the police then said, and so nothing should change. Um, and you just can't understand how um, you can you, you can t- spend seven or eight pages talking about how dangerous the what how dangerous the industry is. How we have no idea what the product is be- that is being sold. Um, we have no idea about the the THC levels in it. We have no idea about the pesticides or herbicides that were used in the production of the product. Um, none of this is, is, um, is controlled, which makes the product dangerous. And yet their recommendation, and they were one of the very few organisations that recommend, recommended for no change. Um, I do note, and um, surprisingly, it took me to today to read it, but I did note that the, the, Liberal, the Liberals um, on the committee did a minority report against the report and they recommended that cannabis stay illegal and that we maybe spend more money on educating people about the harms and dangers dangers of cannabis so it was um, yeah, yeah I, I, I it was it's kind of one of those um back to the future moments or those moments when you just wonder whether you had been in some sort of par- parallel universe throughout the inquiry process and that what you were hearing throughout that process was somehow completely different to what they were hearing because at the end of this process, there is no way that you could have come to any other conclusion that we needed to change the laws. Um, And certainly that is where we went to. Um, And I I, I just just before I um, start talking about their recommendations, I would... I hope people have had a chance to get to to get the report. It's really easy to download, um, but I think one of the you know some of the the most startling startling things that I fa- that we found in the report was the level of criminalisation. I think there's this general sense out there in the community: oh, no one really gets busted for cannabis, you know, like oh, if you do, you just get a warning. Um, that's not true. There was 9,000 arrests last year, sorry, 2018-19, for cannabis in Victoria. They, and 30% of those people were under, uh, under 30. Um, and, that, and so that shows a, an overrepresentation of young people in that. But people are still getting um, arrested for cannabis. People are still going to jail for cannabis, for using or possessing cannabis. And you think that, oh, maybe that's because there must have been another offence there that led to them being imprisoned. But no, people, their main offence was using or possessing cannabis and they have been imprisoned. Um, you know, we, and we, we, we heard this from community legal services, but we also heard this from the police. We heard this from experts like Kate Sear, uh, Professor Kate Sear, 
who's been doing some really terrific work in um, the court, you know, some of the caution, so-called cautioning programs that we have around cannabis. And we have seen a reduction by over 50% in cannabis cautioning in Victoria over the last 10 years. So we are seeing more convictions, more prosecutions, and um, and unfortunately, uh, in those circumstances, the courts have very little discretion. If the police don't allow for a caution, the court can't issue a caution. Uh, and and we we went to that a little bit in in our report. So this is still um, this is still a crime, and it is still a serious crime, and it does go on people's records. And the effect of that criminal record on that person's life is far more harmful than the effect of the drug itself. We know the impacts of a drug conviction on someone's future in their education, future in their employment. And when we talk to, Tor when we talk to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, even on things like kinship um, and caring and getting involved with community boards. I fucking um, hate. Sorry? Oh, uh, it, so we 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 know that um we know that this that 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 the crime itself is far more dangerous than the drug itself. And and that we heard from just about everyone. Yeah, with the exceptions of probably Drug Free Australia and the Delgano Institute, um, who seem to think that I, I I didn't quite follow what they were saying, but somehow it it blows up our chromosomes. Um I'm not really sure how cannabis does that but um apparently it apparently it does but anyway going to the recommendations the recommend the first recommendation that we made and and I'm yeah look I'm disappointed that it wasn't stronger I'm disappointed that it wasn't that the government introduced a framework um uh for uh, sorry I'm just sh shuffling through my papers to see if I can find the the original recommendations um uh, but I can't. Uh, the the original recommendations you'll find them at the back of the report under proceedings. So you'll see the recommendations that I, as the chair, put into the report in my in my draft, and then you'll see that um, government mem members voted them out. And uh, so it was a much more watered down recommendation. But it did still say that the government needs to consider some sort of framework for the decriminalisation of cannabis. Now. We went a lot further. I went further than that, and I certainly was looking at, you know, looking at social. But you know, where where the recommend so the recommendation did did go to the point that we want the government to consider some form of legal framework, and you know, it the 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 words are, are very watered down and you know, not not terribly impressive, but it still started it. It still started looking at the impacts of legalising cannabis. So we've still got those words in a recommendation, so I'm really proud of that. We also, when you look at um, finding number one, which actually would have, looked, would have looked a lot like recommendation number one <laughs> if it had gone in, but in considering the legalisation of cannabis, um, you would look at um, the appropriate level of government regulation you would also, we recommended to establish a regulatory body to oversee a cannabis industry. We looked at regulating the potency of THC in legal cannabis products. We looked at um, market controls um, to avoid sort of that fear of a big tobacco or, you know, uh, to look at a, a large um, cannabis industry, uh, you know, or a big alcohol industry. Uh, so that would look at the restrictions on the marketing and promotion of cannabis. Uh, it would look at how you priced cannabis so you can, um, so that you would be able to knock out the illicit market and the black market. And we we heard from overseas that um, I think in Canada, they're now reporting that probably less than 50% of the cannabis that is sold in Canada is sold on the illicit, via the illicit market. So I think you know, and people are going, oh, God, well, you know, you haven't stopped crime, have you? You know, but when you think that we're talking about an illegal market that has been around and has been profiting for decades, that in three years they were able to halve that market, I think that's pretty impressive. So we, we, um, 
so we looked at all of those areas and and the appropriate tax and, and an appropriate tax framework. Now there are ways that um, that Victoria could establish some sort of uh, taxation, but they are limited, and that so that led to a recommendation that we really needed to to look at how we could uh, work around or work with the Commonwealth. Uh, and initially, the because the Commonwealth has has a drug drug act that that prohibits um, cannabis. Uh, and that that could void state legislation. We initially thought about that, but then I looked at the United States, which is in exactly the same system. They have a federated, they have a federated nation. Um, they have a they have a federal drug. Effectively, they have a federal drug act that prohibits cannabis, um, but they also have eighteen states that have legalized the sale of cannabis. So that they've been able to do it, and I think that's something that we need to, or we need to, um, we we really needed to consider. And so, one of the things I might like to just touch on in in that, just as to highlight, was to look at social clubs. Now there was a big, there was concern, and we heard it, we heard it from a number of organisations that if you were to look at a commercial market for cannabis, um, that they were fearful that it would become like an alcohol, you know, sort of as as pervasive as the alcohol industry, and you know, recognizing that um, cannabis is not harmless, um, you know, and so there there does need to be good controls and good regulation of that industry. So there was quite a lot of conversation about if in baby steps towards a regulated market that you might start with some form of social, some form of regulated social club, where. People could, if we said that, you know, that Victorians could grow up to four plants, then you might be able to have a social club of, say, for example, up to 100 members and those plants and you could have those plants grown by that social club. So these were some of the uh, some of the areas that um, the committee took, took quite a bit of in- interest in. Uh, the other area we looked at, which is, of course, the, the other area um, story about that people talk about cannabis and the effect that it has on people's mental health those links to schizophrenia those links to other negative other negative mental health impacts that it might it that cannabis can have and that the the report really recognized that but it also recognized that it was very low and it also recognized that the way to probably um Moder- moderate the the negative impacts of cannabis and the effects that it has on mental health was to look at how you how you prevent early onset how you prevent um, young people from using a lot of cannabis at a young age uh, also looking at the THC potencies and certainly there was some conversations around um, the the THC CBD so the different cannabinoid um, ratios in products that were cu- currently being sold. Uh, in in Victoria, we also I think backed up everything that the Mental Health Royal Commission said about the lack of treatment, the lack of treatment services um, throughout Victoria. We went to the other recommended areas that we went to were um, were around the criminal justice system and how it's well how it's not working, but certainly we looked at um, the cautioning scheme. We looked at the fact that you can only get two cautions. Uh, we said that that doesn't make any sense, that there should be, you know, that a cautioning scheme should be a cautioning scheme. And um, if you're not going to fully de- decriminalise, then you really should not, um, you should not prosecute someone for the use or possession of cannabis. And as I said at the onset, eight or 9,000 people um, are arrested every year for cannabis. Um, we also talk, we, the, the, the report also reiterates and builds on the 2016 drug law reform when it goes to the impact that stigma has, the, the stigma of illicit drug use has on the health of the people who use that substance. It makes it so much more difficult to seek, to seek treatment um, and it makes it so much more difficult to even, um, yeah, to, to, get, to get any form of help uh, if you have got problematic use. We also found that the vast majority of people who use cannabis do not have problematic use. So finally, where to from here? And I think as we 
you know, as we've seen in other jurisdictions, and I don't think that necessarily Victoria or Australia has to follow this path, but as we've seen in other jurisdictions, we've seen a, a medicinal cannabis industry uh, become mainstream, uh, be, get a broad level of support, and, and from that we've seen this sort of movement to adult use cannabis. I don't actually like the term recreational cannabis. I mean, we don't recreationally drink. Um, I, I'd like, I prefer the term adult use of cannabis. Um, and I, I just mentioned that medicinal cannabis and, and adult use cannabis just because I wanted to make note that um, the most recent growers survey in Australia found that over 70% of people who grow cannabis grow it for medical reasons. Now, I might have a glass of wine at the end of the day or a joint okay. to relax, and you might call that medical reasons. But I think it's not about if it's not about um, if cannabis is legalized, it's about when it's legalized. And this report, as I say, I think provides us with a foundation to build on. The next step is the government's response in six months' time. And yeah, you know, I know speaking privately to members of cabinet and certainly large large numbers of caucus are fully supportive of Victoria going down a path of of a regulated market, going down a path of, of at the very least decriminalisation. But I think that Victoria can go further than that. I think we can create um, a legal and regulated system here. Um, I don't think we should be afraid of the Commonwealth, and I. I certainly hope that the government does take this on. And I hope that that all of you here will also encourage the government um, to take some brave steps, to take some bold moves, to stop spending millions of dollars uh, trying to stop someone using cannabis or trying to stop a community using cannabis while allowing criminal organisations to make millions of dollars. That money could be far better spent, as Hack Sue said, that money could be spent on mental health treatment, on education, um, on, you know, roads and public transport. Those are the areas that I think we should be focusing on. Um, and, look, I'll leave it at that and I'll really open it up for, for questions. I'm sorry, I actually did talk a lot longer than I expected to. I apologise for that. Look, really thank you for that, uh, that, that insight and oversight, Fiona. Uh, one of the questions that has been raised is, were you presented with good, up-to-date, scientifically informed evidence around the link between mental health and uh, and cannabis use? Yes, we were. It was it was some really terrific, and we actually had the Royal College of um, Psychiatrists uh, put in a submission about this, and they talked to this. Um, they talked about um, that when you looked at people who ha you know. That, that genetics was largely in was very much involved in those that that did um, have mental health issues from the use of cannabis, but also um, the younger people started using cannabis and the more and and when they started using it at a very regular level. There's a really good paper by um, a well, he's a I think he's a New Zealander now, Joseph Biden, mm -hmm. and uh, Joseph Biden or Joseph Bowden. Uh, yeah. Biden or Bowden, Google it. He has actually done some really terrific work in in pulling apart a lot of those assumptions that there was this this very strong link between um, mental health and and cannabis use. And I think what they what they've all sort of started to discover is that uh, it's it's not necessarily the use of cannabis, but it's how it's used, when it's used, and and what and what's used. And, and uh, two other questions that have come up. Firstly, around the uh, police, you mentioned uh, what seemed to be a disconnect between what the police presented yeah. and the conclusion that they came to. Um, is there any sense in which they were asked why they were so opposed to uh, to any sort of law reform? Yeah. They, 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 we did ask them that, and and in fact. Um, there's a video on the committee's website, which you can get to via the Parliament website, uh, that, that actually shows their answer. And their answer it was basically because cannabis is dangerous. And, okay. you know, and there, there is, 
everything that we found, everyone, every expert organisation said that the danger is the crime, is the criminality of it, mm-hmm. not the plant itself. Yeah. So uh, that, that's, that's great. So uh, another question has come up is for those that are really interested in progressing the work that's been carried out through your committee, how can we best work towards those recommendations that were made by the committee being progressed and that whole argument, that, that, that sort of um, nuanced argument being progressed within the community? Look, you know, politi- you know poli- politicians... Um, are well-meaning and you know I so we need to lobby our politicians and and I know I probably say this every time I speak to <laughs> to, to 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 the Yarra Forum um but please you know personal representations to MPs does have an impact um if we can get them to understand the community support for change they won't be so frightened of it because right now they listen to the police and the police say just say no just don't do it. Um, they're not listening to, uh, but so they need to hear from their constituents. And I think it's really important um, to either encourage them to look at the report or give them some information from the report. Like use the report if you if you can, you know, or if it's useful. Um, hopefully it is. Uh, but yeah, we need to be lobbying. We need we need to get this on the agenda um, for uh, for the major parties. Yeah, I can do as much as I can in um, as an independent, uh, and I think just getting this report onto the table, getting this report done, uh, provides us with a really useful tool for for pushing this campaign. Um, but yeah, I think it's it it requires us to convince politicians that this is not scary, mm. that this will not you know. That, that, and that it's electorally, even that it's electorally, electorally popular. Uh, thanks, Fiona. So another question is that um, recognising there was such bipartisan support for the uh, voluntary euthanasia mm. bill, and I think it was a conscious vote. Is that is that correct? Why why uh, the question is posing is mm. is this about the stigma of drugs in society? You, you, what, why can't there be a more bipartisan approach, even with the evidence coming out of Canada and the US? I know. It's, it's a really good question and I, I think this does need a bipartisan approach and I think we saw that in Canada that there was, the, well, it wasn't bipartisan, but um, it, the, a large number of the, upper, the senators in particular supported the reforms there. It's when you speak to people privately, when you speak to members of parliament privately, no problem. Mm. Get them on a podium and they, you know, and they 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 go to mush. Um, So why, and I think this is the stigma, I think this is (coughs) for some reason people don't want to talk about this, but this will never be a conscience vote for either parties. I mean, Liberals generally sort of, had the notion that all votes are conscience votes, but um, I can't see this ever um, landing as a conscience vote uh, in our parliament. I think this will have to be a government who ta- who agrees that what we're doing now does not work and that we need to do something else. We need to try something different. Um, Similar to the injecting room, I imagine. Uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm certainly, you know, the, the police, obviously, the police are, um, you know, are are an important part of this. But police should not be making policy. Police should be upholding the the laws and the policy that the government sets them. Um, and I think sometimes governments tend to hide behind the police and say, "Well, oh, the police said no." Um, that that's that's not correct. And I think that's we've got to we've got to challenge our MPs. We've got to challenge our governments about that. And also, I mean, I don't think it would hurt getting, you know, groups like the AMA on board and trying to start getting the yes. support from, from some of those medical organisations because all of the criminal organisations are on side. Yeah, yeah. So the, an, another question would be uh, from one of, our, uh, one of our participants, is there anything that stood out for you personally in terms of the presentation 
or a submission? Is there anything that jumped out at you that was very memorable and made a big impact? Yeah, look, I, I there's there's a couple of there's a couple of things. I mean, I was shocked when I saw the conviction rates for the use and possession of cannabis. I, I really and as someone who who thinks that they're quite informed in this area, um, I was stunned yeah. by the numbers. I was stunned that we are still prosecuting so many people for using or possessing cannabis. Um, so that that really, um, you know, sort of t- took me a bit by surprise. Um, I thought, uh, and and I think also the I hadn't like I'd been to Spain, but I hadn't really looked at their social. Um, social clubs and I'd sort of almost poo-pooed the idea of a social club. But when um I don't remember it was a, a Belgium um a Belgium academic who gave evidence and I his name just escapes me at the moment. But he's written a book around around regulating cannabis and he he wrote a lot about regulating social clubs and the idea of actually establishing a not-for-profit market, cannabis market or cannabis um, mm. growing I- industry. Um, yeah, I, that's not something that I had considered in the past. And mm. I thought that was, I thought that was also um, some, that was, that was interesting. And, and, and again, for someone who thinks that they're quite informed, I, I learned a lot um, around the, uh, the ideas of those alternative markets. I might also just add here, you know, I set this inquiry up in 2019. I wanted to, you know, and we didn't start it really till last year. And I kind of, I had sort of been, we had a homeless inquiry to do. So that was, that took precedence. But, but I was also so hanging my, hanging so much hope on the New Zealand um, vote uh, that, that that would provide a real um, push, uh, push for, for, for this inquiry, which sadly um, wasn't 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 to be, but we did take a lot. We did look at. I looked at the New Zealand model very carefully, and I think that the legislation that they were um, that they put forward was very thoughtful legislation and had some really really good components that mm. that going forward I we would we would use. I think they're the uh, gold medal winners in social policy reform in the world at the moment. Uh, New Zealand, yeah. God, God bless them, or bless them with anyone you like. I know. To, yeah. to, to, we're they're sort of like what Canada is to America. It's yeah, I, I think they're a bit better than Canada, actually. Well, I always think of Canada as good America. You know, it's kind of like America but better. And yeah. I think New Zealand's like Australia but better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, another question would be uh, uh, whether whether there could be the possibility of something like a. I'll, I'll use this word. It's not used in the question. Um, some sort of community survey or plebiscite about this, because I, I, which I think I don't know who asked this because of the, what, the difficulties we've had. I'm getting them all secondhand. The questions, but that sounds like a very interesting suggestion. It is a terrific idea, and um, and and I would love this. I mean, I love the idea this this notion of citizens' juries and this notion of mm. citizens being part of the decision making process and. You know, certainly I think parliamentary inquiries are really good for that because it does provide yeah. this avenue for citizens to take part in policy development and in part, take part in this process. And I really agree with agree with whoever the question who posed that question. I would love to see some sort of plebiscite. I would love to see, you know, even this report act as that document for that citizen jury. So act as the information yes. to then, um, or parts of this, to 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 inform that citizen, those citizens on to to come to some conclusions. It's something we've talked about a lot. Um, they just it's where you find the money for it. Yep. Uh, another. I another noticed there's a couple of councillors here. Maybe maybe Yarra Council could um uh, I, could fund I, I the plebiscite. I, I, I think you'll I think you'll have a uh, a, a keen advocate in Councillor Amanda Stone. It's, yes, I. It, it is one of her areas of specialty, which is yeah. uh, 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 grassroots democracy and grassroots uh, decision making. 
Um, another comment was made about the mental health issue. Yeah. See where this lands, and that was about is the is the issue that people are using cannabis to um, medicate against the effects of mental health, not as the cause of their mental health. Yeah. And um, and I think one of the questions around the research in the past uh, around cannabis and mental health was the inadequacy of the research questions that were examined and the processes. <laughs> So what, what, what's your comments on that? Spot on, spot on. And it was, it was about the questions that were asked. And that's, that's so true. I, I, would, um, I would commend the, the, um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists submit, submission to us. And I think, you know, that there is a peak body and they have teased, they have teased that out very well in their submission. Um, and so we, we spent a whole chapter on, on mental health um, in in the in the report because of you know sometimes that perception of of the mental health dangers and risks of cannabis and so we really tease that out um, and when we you know and I look at finding four the population level risk for the development of psychosis and psychotic disorders as a result of cannabis use is very low yeah and that. In fact, the causal link between cannabis and mental illness uh, was un- was complete was very unclear, and it was about yeah people using cannabis uh, to treat this to treat their illness um, uh, or it, it and and therefore and sometimes that exacerbated their illness. Yeah. Uh, another another comment uh, another question. Sorry, I'm just uh, doing two things at once. Um, one of them was around the issue of why have a recommendation for over the age of 18 and mm. and what about the harm being done to young people who, uh, it, which is a, a tricky number to work out, you know, yeah. how many people under 18 are using cannabis, being exposed to the harms of an illicit market and dealing with organised um, or criminal elements. So the, the question is, why is eighteen sort of the yeah. the the line, and yeah. why and preventing people from becoming engaged in the justice system yeah. under that age? And just yeah. I'll editorialise here. I know within the Aboriginal communities that I'm privileged to do some work in now. Um, that's a really vexed issue about what uh, I mean. Cannabis is a pathway drug, not to addiction, but to the justice system. Mm. It's, it's really a pathway straight into that system, especially for many regional young people and regional Aboriginal young people. We would, I, I would, um, you know, look, where, where do you draw that line? And, you know, we, we saw in Canada they, they, they actually, you know, because we know that we know the impact that substances like alcohol, like yes. cannabis, like other substances can have on a developing brain. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and we, we do know that. And we, so we know there's a risk for young people um, using cannabis and particularly using um, a lot of cannabis. So you've got to look at how you deter that use, how you try and delay that, the, the, delay the use of cannabis to, to older. And, you know, I think in, I think in, the New Zealand model, they were saying the age of 20 was when cannabis could be, le- to be legally available rather than 18. Um, I, I sort of sit at 18 because I think you might as well have a uniform ideal of an adult. But that has to go alongside really good information and education about the risks of cannabis yeah. um, and ab- about why it's not good for young brains. But, sorry, and then, but then in com- answer to your actual answer to your question, You've got to decriminalise the use of cannabis for everyone. Yeah. You might make a legal market only available to adults, but you cannot criminalise children for using using cannabis. And we saw that's how New Zealand. That's how um, sorry. That's how Canada went, and it's also how the it's also how the ACT has dealt with that. Yeah. So you 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 might legally be able to access cannabis over eighteen, and but. You, you would not criminalise the use of cannabis for people under 18. And I, if I can just say, I mean, the same argument's been used and, you know, my background, Fiona, mm. I, I've worked with people that are injecting drug users under the age of 18 I know. For, for four and a half decades. Yeah. 
and we still won't allow them to use a supervised injecting facility. They can die of an overdose just as easily in a lane way as uh, as anyone over the age of 18. Yeah. So yeah. we are faced with these difficult social um, and, and I know that the public generally would see it as a bridge too far if we had a picture of 15-year-old girls mm-hmm. going into the North Richmond Community Health Injecting Facility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so we do live with that political reality. But I've just got a couple more questions that I want yeah. to get to. And uh, one of them's a, a really big question, so I'm going to have to read it, I think. Um, one of them was uh, frustration about you can write a report and these recommendations as part of a parliamentary process and it actually is com- can be completely ignored by whatever government is in power. And so it really goes to um, uh, is that okay? Uh, shouldn't these reports have more, if they go to all that work and collect all that evidence, shouldn't they have more gravitas and more uh, more power implied yeah. in their recommendations? Yeah. Look, I, I'm an eternal optimist. Um, so, and, and you know, don't imagine that, that my advocacy for cannabis law reform has ended now that the report's been written. It's kind of I've now got six months to convince the government to respond to my report, to respond to this report and respond positively and respond progressively and proactively to it. Um, and, and I would encourage everybody else to do that as well to, 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 get, to get governments. Yeah, it, look, it raises, it's an interesting question. You know, should governments be directed and be, you know, kind of formally directed by, by committee of reports? Um, they, they are informed by them, but we don't say that if a committee recommends this, the government must do that. Yeah, I, I, just as a, a slight aside on this, I, I was successful in getting e-petitions up in the Legislative Council you know, it seemed like a. It seemed weird that in 2018 you could only actually petition the parliament with paper and pen. But we've now got electronic petitions. But what happens to them? So you get thousands of people will sign a petition to legalise cannabis, and then what happens to that petition? Nothing. So I'm even looking at that, like how we get a government to respond in a better way to when 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 our you know when our constituents and when the community. Um, petitions the parliament to change that we sh- there should be a process that that is given good consideration. This report, the process is that the government will consider this report and respond to the recommendations within six months. Um, so, you know, and and they may go yeah nah, um, yep. and, and, but I but I hope they don't. I think the thanks for that, Fiona. I think the other question that's but one of the other questions that's been asked is really at the point of stigma and how there is so much stigma around, it seems in this country especially, around the medical use of cannabis. So for health or yeah. pain management or uh, and and I know that's um a disputed area of science and medicine, but there's a contra I've sat in many uh, uh a symposium with a bunch of doctors. I don't know how I ended up there online, but you do. And I was surprised to hear at the uh, the lack of international acceptance that cannabis um, has any role in that area. You know, but how do we do? Do you think this report can help with that stigmatization or destigmatization process around the medical use of cannabis? I should I should hope so. I should hope so. And I think you go back to um, the relatively conservative statistics that we had that one in three Victorians has used cannabis. You know, this is not something that people are unfamiliar with. Yeah. And, um, and you know, and a- around 11% of Victorians acknowledge that they use cannabis regularly. Regularly, yeah. This, this, is, this is a common substance out there. And the way that, the way that we approach it um, the way we load it with stigma, the way that, you know, you see, you know, stoner sloth ads and ridiculous um, advertising and campaigns like that, um, that has got to change and that has got to change because people should be able to openly talk to their doctors about their cannabis use, uh, about the benefits of that cannabis use. And I think that's so, yeah, thanks, Nick. I think that's so important and it's something that it's really hard to talk about. We we talk about the 
the, the damages, we talk about the risks of cannabis use, but we rarely have that opportunity to talk about the positive impact that cannabis use has. And we heard that in the, in the individual submissions, talking about their personal use, how it either, you know, help them with anxiety, help them sleep, um, help them relax, uh, all of those things that actually are health benefits of a substance. But it's it's so hard to talk about those benefits. I think that's changing and I see that Reese Cohen's here and Reese has been doing a lot of t- really terrific work in the medicinal cannabis area uh, and um, I, I, you know, we're seeing more and more doctors every week prescribing cannabis. We're seeing mm-hmm. more and more people. You know, I think everybody now knows someone someone who has been prescribed cannabis. We still we still have issues with insurance companies, but and you know and governments, and we still have issues with medicinal cannabis patients and their you know being able to drive. You know, we've still got significant issues that we've got to overcome, but we it is improving. And, you know, again, I go back to that report from um, the growers survey, which said that 70% of people growing cannabis today in Victoria, today in Australia, are doing it for health purposes. Yeah. Uh, so one of the, uh, other, one of the uh, two questions to go, I think we've got um, uh, the role of the media in, in terms of, I suppose, fake news and fake information about drugs, media's not been distinguished, well, hard to talk about all media being the same, but sections of the media, the populist media, often aren't great conveyors of good, solid information around real risks and real harms and real benefits. And uh, so that's one question, the role of the media. And the second question is, is there any specific programs or organisations that help promote and inform school students about the risk of cannabis use? That came that came across in your your uh, your hearings. Uh, what <laughs> second question first um, around the education? What we basically heard is that the education is appalling. Yep. Um, that the education that's provided now is absolutely appalling, and we need to redo it. We need to rethink it, and um, we're not being honest uh, with the education that we provide to to students, and that. The curriculum needs to change enormously and we need experts to be providing the information um, and that this is an area where really having outside people coming into schools to talk about this would be very beneficial. You know, I, I certainly, uh, names don't come to me right now, but certainly in the report you'll see yeah. that we, we, we received evidence from some education bodies. But also when you look at um, any drug use that becomes problematic, it's, it's around, you know, it's not necessarily about the drug and about the education around the drug. You know, it's actually about the resilience of that person. And so, you know, looking at how we make young, you know, how we ensure that our young people are as, as resilient and strong as they can be, yeah. that that will have, that will, so that will provide that protector from, you know, any of the more harmful effects of that drug use can have. So we talked about that. Um, the first question about the media, yes, the media can be a pain, but it can also be your friend. And I think uh, we all need to be vigilant. We all need to, to play that role in correcting media when it's incorrect. Um, we all need to, to um, and now with social media, now with, with things like Twitter, you can immediate, you can go direct to the journalist. You can immediate, you can correct them immediately. And it, and it does behove us to do that. It is a role that we need to play. But media can be our friend. And we certainly saw this with the um, initially when we go back to the supervised injecting room um, debate, you know, it was some of the work of really good journalists that really helped us in that. And at that time, we even had the support of the Herald Sun. Now, yep. <laughs> that's, that's changed in recent times, but um, without... You know, without media to help us in these campaigns, um, it's really it's really hard to articulate the arguments to the community. I, I think you've uh, picked up on a really important point around the education system. We 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 have always underestimated the intelligence and the subtlety and the nuance of young people. Well, but one thing they do know: when you lie to them, 
they know it. That's right. And uh, and then they don't believe anything else you ever say about that subject once again. So the final question we've got is really a statement, but you can comment on it, and that is um, the, uh, the the it, it's really around the use of the word medical as opposed to just use, right? And why you have to use the word medical to legitimise any type of cannabis use. Yeah. And um, any thoughts on that? Oh, look, it's the same as I hate the word recreational use. Um, and, and I totally agree that this is, you know, this is a plant that provides a spectrum of benefits to people. Now, for some of them, it absolutely is medicinal. It absolutely is addressing, um, you know, significant medical problems. Um, but for, for, for others, it's in between. You know, it, it's, a, it's a spectrum. So for someone who, you know, at the end of the day, a glass of wine helps them um, c- come back down, you know, close off their work day and open up their day to their fa- open up their evenings or their day to their family. Is that medicinal? Mm-hmm. Um, and someone who uses cannabis um, for those p- for, for for similar purposes, you know, is that medicinal? I I think I would love to get to a point where we you know cannabis was cannabis, but certainly there is a role for the, re- the med- medical research that's being done into the use of this plant, um, you know, for, for patients and for, for very sick and ill people. Um, you know, our body has this whole endocannabinoid system in it. We, our body was designed to respond to cannabinoids yeah. and that, that is really exciting research and I don't think, well, I think cannabis should be available and you know, whether you're taking it as you might a glass of wine or, or a beer at the end of the day or you're taking it for it to, to, to assist you in managing pain. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I, I, I get where that person's coming from, but I do also recognise that there is some really significant medical work being done with cannabis. Look, um, I think we've uh, taken up a lot of your time today, Fiona, but... Um, just in closing, I'd like to acknowledge um, people often complain about the money we pay for our politicians. I think our money is well spent in your case, Fiona. <laughs> Thanks, and Peter. I, and, I th- and I think we are, I think we are really fortunate in this state to have politicians from all varieties during COVID time. I think have really demonstrated a tremendous community service and community benefit. And uh, we're lucky to live with the parliament that we have, as frustrating as it might be at times. So we want to acknowledge your work and the work of all the uh, the members of your of your uh, committee and Thank you. that produce this report. And um, uh, we're really keen to help. Lots of people have written in. So I, I'd, imagine, I'd imagine contacting your office yeah, would be a, a, a good way to, yeah. to get that more more uh, nuanced. But also just to say to everybody that attended today, even the people that were skellywags, um, we're really pleased to have had you today. We look forward to engaging with you in the future. And remember, the 31st of August is International Overdose Awareness Day, started by the great Sally Finn of the Salvation Army down in St Kilda all those years back. And uh, we, we hope to have, we don't hope to have, we'll be having an event on, on, that, on that night and uh, look forward to people joining in. P- and f- Peter, yeah. Peter, can I just, sorry, can I just do a plug? I, I, you we can. Will, we'll be doing a lot more on this cannabis report. We will be rolling out a lot more information about it. So if people are interested in getting more information, just go onto my website, fionapatton.com.au, and just sign up to the newsletter because I'll send out um I'll send out camp information. Um, we'll be steadily re- releasing more and more information about the report. Mm. And just, no, that, that, that's fantastic, Joan. So just thank you once again. And I'll just say one last thing. Um, ignorance and, and untruth love echo chambers. Never afford untruth an echo chamber. Always speak to the truth. And I know uh, our cousins and friends in the Aboriginal community love it when uh, white fellas say cut it out, that's not okay when it comes to racism in the same way 
misinformation about drug use is 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 in the same league of harm as uh, racism and prejudice of all sorts. And uh, I, I, we thank you for your service to this state and to us as uh, members of this community, Fiona. Thank you very, very much. Cheers.